So your title coach is director of coach development. Is that it? Uh, and then also uh, director coach development plus uh, junior national team uh, uh, coach uh, director. I believe we're live, so just give me a second to confirm and we'll just start, Coach. I'm gonna grab some water quick. Great. So, Coach, we're ready. We're live on Facebook, on the Facebook page of the Cyprus Basketball Federation. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Coach Don uh, Showalter with us today, Director of Coach Development of the uh, USA Basketball Youth Division and uh, Coach of the U.S. Na junior National Teams. A lot of success uh, within, uh, for throughout many years. Uh, very experienced coach uh, in junior levels. We're very happy to have you with us, and we're looking forward to what you're going to speak to us today. So greetings from Cyprus, and uh, the floor is yours, Coach. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, very humble to be here with all the coaches from Cyprus and, and Greece. Uh, I haven't had the chance to travel to Greece, uh, but uh, one of the few places I haven't been to. But uh, one of these days, I'd love to travel to Greece and not only uh, see, the, see what basketball is like in Greece, but I know it's, which I know is very good. Yeah, but also it's a, be a great place to travel. So appreciate uh, coaches being on. And I'm going to cover kind of a lot of different things from the USA basketball standpoint, share some screens with you um, uh, from there. So a little bit about my, just kind of a quick intro about my experience. Um, I grew up in Iowa, which uh, we're about three hours driving time uh, west of Chicago, Illinois. So we're right in the middle of the United States. I grew up in Iowa and uh, I actually coached, coached for 42 years here in Iowa high school, in Iowa high school. So uh, after coaching for 42 years, I retired from being our athletic director and coach at high school and then went full time with USA basketball. Uh, during that time that I was coaching high school basketball, I also coached our junior men's national team, U16 and U17 teams with, uh, with USA Basketball, and uh, very much enjoyed that and was very humbled to be asked to coach that for 10 straight years. Uh, so I um, uh, appreciate getting to know many international coaches, many international teams, and it was a real thrill for me to coach at that level. Uh, after I retired and I worked full time 2016, 17, I worked full time, started full time with USA basketball. And now I um, organize junior national teams and coach development. So during that time, we've had many, 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 many of our players go on to play uh, NBA. Uh, one of the most recent ones, Jason Tatum, who plays for Boston Celtics, was an all star this year. Uh, he was probably one of my favorite players just from the standpoint of being a great person uh, as well as a great player. So, um, so uh, worked with Coach, Coach Krzyzewski, Coach K a lot with, when he coached the Olympic teams um, as well. So I had a lot of different uh, experiences that kind of meshed into my basketball coaching. And I, I think as young coaches, as coaches that are listening in, uh, you need to find yourself a mentor and a, a mentor is, is obviously somebody that you can uh, bounce things off of. You can visit with when things are going good or when they're not going so good, but mentors are really important. Uh, I think for coaches and even older coaches have been, that have been coaching many years uh, still have mentors that they turn to. So uh, my suggestion would be for you, as a coach uh, to find somebody that you can really trust that will give you some help in your, in your growth as a coach. 
Uh, many of those people for me were coaches I met at camps uh, growing up. Uh, as a young coach, I worked many, many camps in the United States and got to know coaches. Uh, I worked one of the most, uh, obviously the most famous camp that I worked was uh, John Wooden's camps at UCLA. Uh, many of you may have heard of him, but he, he's uh, won 10 out of 12, na 10 national championships in 12 years. And uh, he was one of the per people that I searched out to work his camp. And that was a real thrill for me. And, and because of that, then I got to know people from USA basketball and, and everything else. Uh, my first involvement with USA basketball, I coached the hoop summit and uh, many of you have heard of the hoop summit. It's a game uh, that is played with our top uh, 19 year olds, 18 and 19 year olds against international competition. And that's played in uh, now it's played in Portland the time I coached in 1998, it was played in uh, San Antonio uh, during the Final Four. And we played against, I'm sure, a player that you have heard of by the name of Dirk Nowitzki. At that time, Dirk was a very young player, 19 years old, out of Germany, that had uh, really no, uh, he, had, he was really unknown from the basketball standpoint, because at that time there was very few uh, events that that those the, the people like him played in to show off his skills. So that was his coming out party when we played against him in San Antonio. Uh, he play, had a great game and then obviously played uh, played many many years in the NBA and and uh, we all know what how that took off. So that was my first involvement with USA basketball. And then I, I worked some festivals. Festivals were, were games where we invited 40 uh, events where we invited 40 players into our Olympic Training Center, guys like LeBron James, Chris Paul, James Harden, uh, Jason Kidd, all those, Carmelo Anthony were all part of our festivals. And then FIBA started the U16 and U17. They started those divisions in 2009 and uh, dropped the 21 and you 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 20 and you 21 I think uh, divisions just for younger players so that 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 really helped USA basketball tremendously and if you remember right uh, I think 2004 um, the United, United States play, uh, finished with a bronze medal I'm not sure that might have been even in Athens but 2004 was not a good year for uh, United, US, USA basketball simply because of the fact that uh, we were trying to organize our, our senior team and we needed some, we really needed to take an overhaul with that. So that was good timing for FIBA to start with our younger kids, U16, U17. So I did a lot of work with uh, Coach K from Duke, who was our, um, took over with our Olympic team in 2008. And uh, one of the things we wanted is consistency with our program. I know a lot of coaches are coaching club basketball, uh, obviously in the international level, but consistency is a huge thing for uh, basketball. I think if you can be consistent with what you do uh, and teach things the same way consistently, you have an upper hand. So uh, we press, we run, we do similar things out defensively and offensively. So that, that helped grow our game a little bit from our, our junior national team all the way up through our our senior team. One of the things that uh, Coach K developed was what we call a list of standards. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, share those standards and let's see if we can get this going here. Okay. Can everybody see those? No, coach, we have to. Uh, no. Try to search, uh, try to um, share screen. Let me try. I thought I had share screen on there, but. 
There we go. Let's try this. Yeah, I think that one should be fine. Yeah, here we are. So we see your screen now, Coach. You can continue. Let me make that a little bigger. How's that? Everybody can see that okay now? Yeah, yeah perfect, perfect, Coach. Okay. These are... Uh, these are gold standards that actually Coach K came up with, uh, Coach Kruseski from Duke came up with in 2008 uh, as he was coaching the Olympic team. And one of the things that uh, really struck me as a, as a coach was that um, the word rules were hardly ever used. Um, you know, you have, you might have some rules on the court, what you do on defense, but really, uh, Coach K used the word standards time and time again. And I think this was really helpful for our young players, our U16, our U17 players. It was also helpful for our, excuse me, for our, uh, for our, my high school teams uh, as well. So, and I even coach my grandson's 10 year old team when I'm back in Iowa. And one of the things that we talk about are, are standards. And we may not have these exact standards and we may not have 15 of them like uh, like Coach K came up with for the Olympic team, but uh, we do have a set of standards. And so just to give you a little bit of uh, flavor of what these standards are, I'm going to quickly go through, maybe explain a little bit of, uh, of them as we go. Uh, number one is no excuses. And this is really a, uh, this is, a, this is a standard that I think is overlooked a lot. And uh, I, was, I was in a team meeting with Coach K and the Olympic team back in 2008. And one of the things that uh, they were talking about standards, and they, haven't, they hadn't developed these standards yet at all. So LeBron James raised his hand and says, you know, he says, I wanted to play with the best players in the world. And now I'm sitting with Carmelo Anthony and Chris Paul and Jason Kidd and, and, and uh, players who I've really, uh, really wanted to play with uh, all my life. And, and now we're, we're going to play together. So we have no excuses um, to win. And coach K said, he said, all right, that's a, that's a great standard. And we're going to have that as our, our first standard, no excuses. So that's how that came about. And, and as a young, as he is coaching young players, uh, that that is a that is a high standard because if something doesn't go right to a young player, many times they look for for an excuse. Well, you know the officials, uh, uh, I didn't feel good, or whatever. So we really emphasize that with our young players. Well, there's no excuses. Uh, you do what you can. You play as hard as you can. You do what you can for the team, but, and then and then no excuses. So. I thought that was a great standard for standard. Uh, let me back up a little bit. Standards are something that you, as a, as a player, strive to attain or an individual. You try to attain these standards, uh, which has a very positive connotation to it. Rules, by, by, uh, just by what rules are, sometimes have much more negative connotation rules are it might be you know rules are uh what time you get in here's what you do uh you know off the court so rules sometimes to players have a much more negative connotation where standards have a much more positive connotation number two is great defense one of the things that we stress with our players obviously is we have to use our abilities athletic ability to play great defense and uh, we stress that a lot Three is communication. Communication is extremely difficult to get across to young players. 16 and 17 uh, age, age groups are very, it's very intimidating for them to communicate. One of the things we give them some tools to communicate and some of those tools are when you, when you communicate with somebody, you look them in the eye uh, we always start out by calling out the first name of the player that we're communi communicating with. Uh, Billy, I like the way you rebounded that last rebound. So you, you communicate that way. 
if, if players see you communicating in the proper way, uh, they also will communicate in the proper way. And uh, a lot of things go into, go into communication. And we work on these in, in not only a practice situation, but we try and put players in a situation where during practice they have to communicate. So they have to organize themselves into groups for drills. Uh, I may tell one player the drill, he has to communicate that drill to everybody else. So you're teaching them how to communicate uh, on the court. And that's, uh, to me, that's extremely important. We always say that communication, if, you, if I go into a gym and watch a practice, a, uh, a, a, a gym that's not very loud and doesn't communicate is a losing gym. And I'll go to another gym where there's a lot of communication. That's a winning gym. And communication must be done. You got to have consistent communication and it's got to be candid communication. Don't waste terms. Don't waste words when you communicate. Be candid, be consistent. Uh, and so I think that's important. Also, one other thing with communication that, that I think is really important is on the court, we, we give our players a three, three pronged method to communicate. You communicate early. So if you see a screen coming, you could communicate screen, screen, screen early, loudly, so everybody can hear it, and often. So that's a three-prong way to communicate on the court. Early, loud, and often. And that often is three times. So if we say if you're if you're defending a player who's going to set the screen, we would say you would communicate uh, early, screen, 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 loud, and then often. And, and so we give them some direction to communicate. And I think that has really helped, helped us with young players uh, learning how to communicate. Trust, you know, we believe in each other. Of all the ones I uh, that are here, trust is probably the most important for me as a coach and for the players. They have to be able to trust you as a coach. They have to be able to believe in you that you're gonna do what's best for them. And especially when I coach high level players like our U17 players that are elite, they all want to get to the NBA. And so they, there has to be a level of trust there that they trust you as a coach that you're gonna make them better and they're going to make you're going to make them uh, improve their game and improve their skills. Um, so I think that's important. Also, what goes with trust is whatever you promise, you better come through with. So if you promise a player, you know, if you get better at shooting, uh, we'll be able to you'll be able to start for us in the top five. Well, if he improves his shooting and he doesn't ever start. Uh, you, he's lost a lot of trust in you. So I always say, uh, from a coaching standpoint, we don't, we don't promise very, we promise very little, but we, we try and deliver a lot, uh, with that collective responsibility as well. We're committed to each other, uh, uh, care, care is just being a good teammate. You care about your teammates, pick somebody up off the floor. You're happy when somebody on your team get, has a great play. That's care. Um, Jason Kidd came up with respect. He said, you know, if we have respect, we're going to be on time. And uh, Coach K said that's a great example of respect. Respect your coaches. Respect your teammates. We're always on time. Again, instead of having a rule that says be on time, we have a standard that says respect, which includes respecting uh, and being on time. Uh, number eight is intelligence, taking good shots, be smart, poise. Um, we try and show no weaknesses. Uh, poise is something that how you conduct yourself on the court would be poise. Flexibility, uh, God knows we gotta be flexible in every game because there's so many different situations that come about on the court during a game 
we really got to be flexible and you can't be complaining. Uh, you know, learn how to handle the situations. And again, it, it comes from a practice session. So as a coach, you have to build these into your practices. Unselfishness. Uh, I love the term. Our value is not measured in playing time. Too many times a, a player uh, measures his value only as playing time. And that's certainly not, not the case. And so that takes really an attitude change. Aggressiveness, we play hard. Enthusiasm, this is fun. We want our players to bring th enthusiasm every day. In fact, we tell our coaches, our, my coaching staff, uh, there's two things you have to bring every day to practice for the players that you are under your uh, jurisdiction. But you need to have bring enthusiasm and passion every day in practice. Uh, because I don't think players have bad practices, but I think coaches have bad practices. And when you don't bring enthusiasm as a coach, it's pretty hard to have your players have enthusiasm. Performance, we're hungry, we have no bad practices, and then pride. Um, so I will, I'll end that there with, with, the, uh, with the gold medals. Uh, is there, is there uh, questions on any of those that I can answer before moving on? Coach, I think it's better if we take the questions at the second part, not to interrupt. Second part. Okay. Yeah, just just uh, a reminder for the coaches watching us now that you uh, gave us the opportunity that uh, whoever has questions, please write them down on the comments section of the Facebook page and we'll, we'll, we'll ask the coach all the questions in the second part. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put up another slide here. Uh, I hope it kind of comes up. Uh, can we see that? Can everybody see that slide? Yeah, yeah. You say okay. yes. Clear DNA. Yeah. Okay. Um, many times, uh, one question I get uh, is, how do you, when you go watch players, because we have so many players in our country, how do you choose players to play for our team? And, and this is this is kind of uh, really a good question because I go see thousands of players during the, during the season and watch them play on their high school teams or in big tournaments. And how do I pick out players that are suited for us with our junior national team? And one of the things I will say is that uh, our staff, we have just two of us, but we see every player that we invite for our training camps. And um, we think that's really important. So we think there's, there's really five different things. We call it our DNA. And DNA is what people are made up of, what makes up uh, every individual. And so we have five different things that we like to have our players are made up of or our DNA is so to speak. So when I go look at players, I look for these five things as I watch players. Uh, first one is smart. Uh, they got to be smart on the court, you know, making great choices. We have, we have a big saying, one of our big C's is choices. You know, how smart are you playing the game? making good decisions. If you remember, one of our standards was intelligence, uh, taking good, what's a good shot and what isn't. If a player continually takes uh, a poor shot and, and that has no chance of going in, that, that tells me he's not very smart. Or if he continue, continuously uh, makes the wrong pass uh, to teammates, that's not very smart. So we really gauge, we really gauge that, uh, in a player. Um, second one is tough. Um, this is kind of hard to define, but, uh, players DNA tough is one of those that we think is you look, you look at a player and you just know if he's tough and, uh, you know, uh, we, we look at a player, does he, does he go after the, does he go after 50, 50 basketballs on the floor? Uh, does he, 
Does he get rebounds out of his area? Uh, is he a, is he really, is he really a defensive? Can he really stick somebody on defense? Um, does he want, does he want to get to the free throw line? Um, you know, those taking charges, those are all tough things. And, and, uh, we think that's really important for, for players, uh, as well, because toughness is, is, is really, uh, an attitude. And, and I'm, I'm surprised at how many elite players that we get with our U16 and U17 and, and we'll invite many of them into training camp, but they don't display the toughness that we like. And so therefore they don't make our, maybe our top 12. Number three is skilled. We want players that are very skilled. Uh, and I'll, I'll cover in a little bit here what the, uh, you know, what we, what we think are the skills that need to be taught. But skilled is, you know, are, are they skilled at, at various things? Can they shoot? Can they give a b- good ball handling? Are they skilled on defense? So skilled is not just one, but it's many different aspects of that player. And we, we love to have, obviously, skilled players. And to be realistically, we have many, many skilled players in our country. Uh, and then what separates them is, you know, how tough they are, how smart they are. Uh, and then number four is versatile. Versatile for us, because we play international competition with our U16 and U17, we like players that can play more than one position. Uh, you know, we'll travel to Europe, as, as you all know, uh, in South America, Argentina has very good basketball. But when we travel the world, we are uh, we need to have players that are versatile. So maybe they can play anywhere from a point guard to a wing to a forward. Uh, if we have those kind of players, we feel pretty good uh, that we can that they can contribute as opposed to if they're locked into one position. Uh, we've had many players over the years that, for instance, they'll say, you know what, I'm, I'm a point guard and that's where I'm going to stay. Well, you, you've already sit, told us that you're not very versatile. And so the likelihood of making our team is probably not as good as it would be if you could play, hey, I'll, coach, I'll play more than one position. I'll be glad to play a wing. And then the last one is resilient. Resilient is a term that we look at uh, when things don't go well on the court, how do you respond as a player? So, you know, th- you, you make a turnover, what happens after that turnover? Do, do you not get back on defense and stop the fast break? Uh, do, you, do you get up after, you know, you, you save a loose basketball, do you, you put yourself back in the play? Um, you know, resilient is, is here we come again. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that uh, you're not going to score on me attitude playing defense. That's resilient. Um, a little bit like toughness, only resilient probably is a little uh, a term where uh, it, it, it takes into context, uh, you know, making up for a bad play, responding to something that doesn't go quite right on the court would be resilient. So those are our DNAs that we look for. And even when I coach high school, I mean, that, this is what we had as a, as a high school. Pl- you know, if you, if you can exhibit those five, uh, player, five DNA attributes on my high school team, you're probably going to have a, a lot of success on our, on our team. Now, obviously, <clears throat> we, don't, we can't recruit players to play for my high school team uh, like we do for like we do for players with our uh, national team. So it takes on a little different meaning because we have to certainly coach and make do with the players that we have uh, in our school. Um, the other thing to go with the player DNA is we always want players to remember that there are things you can do with no talent. And um, sometimes this sets apart, you know, we have players that exhibit all those five levels of DNA, such as these, uh, you know, they all do that, but this may set them apart uh, from being a player that, that we pick and choose 
for being a great uh, player uh, or a possible NBA player as such. You know, these require zero talent, being on time, which is respect, work ethic, hard work. Uh, work ethic has to do a little bit with toughness as well. Uh, effort, you know, body language, how you show us, you know, how, how your body language uh, is displayed on the court and off the court. That's really a big thing for us. If you, if I go watch a player play in his body language, he's rolling his eyes at the coach during a timeout, or he's, he's slumped back in his seat when he comes out and, and really isn't in watching the game. That's poor body language. And chances are you will not be part of our team if you have bad body language. Energy, attitude, what's your attitude like is huge. Uh, passion. You know, what the passion you bring to the game, the court, passion helps make everybody better uh, as well. Being coachable, doing extra, being prepared. So those are some of the things that uh, we think are really important that require no talent at all. And in combination with these five DNA aspects, that's a pretty good situation for a player to make our team. Um, so that kind of gives you an overview of what we look for and, and how do we, how we expect uh, players, what we expect out of players. A uh, couple other things I'm going to cover here are some, are some culture things that we do with USA Basketball. Let me see if I can pull these up here. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, coach. Okay. All right. Let me, uh, I'm just going to cover a few things here that I think are really important. Definition of a coach in our dictionary is a carriage pulled by horses. And a, a carriage is kind of a, uh, um, a cart or a wagon that <clears throat> six or eight horses pull. And, uh, this is kind of a, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, <clears throat> it, it's a coach, and it also can uh, illustrate a basketball coach. You know, a basketball coach, really, we are the carriage, but we're pulled by our players, uh, by our horses, so to speak. So how we coach them is a big indication of how they're going to pull us along. And I just think that's a great definition of the word coach. Uh, just real quick here, we, we teach, um, we really have a strong curriculum within our USA basketball, and we strongly uh, emphasize teaching progressive development. So when you teach young kids, you don't teach them the same way as you teach our, our elite players. Uh, there's a big difference there. You, know, you start out by you know, coach six and seven year olds, you, you start out by dribbling by just having them hold the basketball, have one, one dribble or one bounce and pick it up and hold it. And then you progress from uh, doing that many times to walking and then running and then going through cones and then behind the back between the legs. So that's progressive. And coaches, I think, try to skip steps in that model in that progressive development. And when you skip steps, you're, you're going to frustrate the players that you're with. If they're not ready, if they're not ready for that next step, um, then that, that really it hinders the progressiveness. It's, it's based on a mastery of basketball skills. So when you kind of master that one bounce and pick up, then you're ready for the next, for the next one. And it's really not based on any age or grade or gender or physical attributes. It's based on the mastery. So that's our player development. And we're, we try and stick to that. We try and educate coaches on that uh, throughout. I always say, and I know I, <clears throat> we probably have coaches here that coach uh, mini basket. I think that's what 
they call it in 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 uh, the, the FIBA aspect of it is mini basket. But we have a lot of play. I'm sure we have some coaches that coach at that level. That's extremely uh, important level to coach. And I always said that if you really want to find out what kind of coach you are, you will go coach a nine year old group, boys or girls. Then you'll find out really what kind of coach you are because you have to really break the game down and progressively coach it. Now, having said that, there's four levels that we think are really important. Introductory level is the basic level. They're just trying to figure out what basketball is. Uh, the main thing in introductory level, I think that people miss, is this is a level that coaches need to emphasize how they can make the player love the game. How do they love the game? Each one of us as coaches has had somebody that made us love the game of basketball. And uh, in order to do that, uh, you know, they've, they've taken, uh, you know, they've taken different things and made, just made us love the game. I know it was my, when I was about uh, 10, 11 years old, uh, but uh, uh, you know, the, these kind of things, uh, uh, the coach at that time, just, I couldn't wait to get back. Couldn't wait to work on my skills. And it goes through foundational, which is about ages 12, 13. Where you have, this is now the player decides that they want to be a good player and they want more skill level. So introductories are just kind of trying to figure it out, kind of a community based level where you have a bunch of kids in a community working on, working on, working on uh, introductory level skills and just having fun playing the game, just having fun. And then you have your advanced, which is basically our high schools in, in the States, our advanced level. And then performance is our college, our junior national team camps, and all those uh, as well. So these are the four levels uh, that, that we really emphasize. Now, uh, <clears throat> we think this is really important. There are eight skills that need to be taught with any basketball player at any age, including, you know, future NBA players that we get with our USA basketball team. On these was footwork and balance. Uh, footwork is an essential skill that, uh, you know, you, you learn how to use your feet. And I always thought that international players did a much better job of footwork and balance than American players did. They, they knew how to use their feet much better uh, to, get, to get where they wanted to get to. One of the coaches, the coaches in the United States from Villanova, Jay Wright, who many of you I'm sure, I'm sure have heard, if you would go watch his practice, you would be amazed at the simple footwork drills he does. And I'm gonna put a video here uh, that shows one of ours. Uh, ball handling, you know, uh, how you can handle a basketball. Ball handling includes dribbling uh, as well. Uh, ball handling includes right hand and left hand. Probably one of the, the least developed skills for young players, in my estimation, is using the weak hand. So if you're right-handed, using that left hand. And and I just, uh, you, you're just, you're only about half the player you can be if you don't develop that left hand, that weak hand. Shooting, screening is a skill that sometimes is not taught very well. Screening, and I'll, I'll back up here to our, uh, to our levels. Screening is really not taught until we get to the foundational level. Our introductory level is all about spacing, passing and cutting and spacing. Then our foundational level, we might put some screening into it. But at the introductory level, if we put screening into that level, you know how that happens with, with young players is they all go, they all bunch up together to get the basketball. And we've all seen that kind of a, uh, a comedy atmosphere. But when they get to the foundational level, then we can start teaching screening. Passing and receiving is a uh, skill and, that, that needs to be taught. And I would say uh, most international 
teams that we play against, the ones that are really good can pass and catch the ball really good. We played against Turkey in the U-17 World Cup one year. We played against France in 2018. Uh, we played against Spain. We play against uh, Argentina and South America and Brazil. They are great passing and receiving teams. And I would say that passing and receiving, again, if you look at this level, introductory level is more technique in, in passing, stepping, following through. But as we advance, foundational advance, passing becomes more of a decision-making skill. So it goes from a technique skill to a decision-making skill. You know, how to make this, how to make a pass in a game situation uh, to your teammate uh, when there's a, when there's defense, when, when you're getting a lot of defensive pressure. So now you're not so much concerned about technique as how to make that pass uh, and decision-making. Uh, rebounding is a great skill. Obviously, sometimes rebounding is overlooked. And then the last two, whole offense and whole defense, are skills that we think are really important. But we, but we also include these as skills that are not necessarily five on five. Uh, one of the things I did not do as a young coach, that I did a much, much better job as a more experienced coach, we played a lot of three on three to develop our whole offense. And from, from three on three, uh, it, it gives the court a much op more open and there's much more things that you have to cover in a three on three half court uh, work than it would be if you put five on five. So we think three on three is a great way to teach offense if you if you at the introductory level if you're playing three on zero three on three you're working on spacing you know you're working on making pass and making a basket cut to the basket we call that a scoring cut and then you fill so you cut and fill and that also does a little, does goes for the foundational level uh as well so uh obviously you have to play a little bit of five on five but but really our our emphasis with those two whole offense and whole defense because you can teach better the kids the players in your in your group will learn better they will learn quicker when you have a three on three or four on four action as opposed to five on five so those are the eight skills let me just comment a little bit on these skills of these eight skills uh, you never graduate from a skill in other words, you never get good enough at one of those skills that you're never going to work on it again. Skills need refreshing. No matter if you're a college player, if you're a high school player, if you're an NBA player, skills need refreshing. I go watch the Boston Celtics training camp. <clears throat> and in that training camp, they are working on a lot of skills that need to be refreshed. A great example would be arguably the best shooter in the game of basketball in the NBA is Stephen Curry. And Stephen Curry is a great shooter, but he is a great shooter because he continues to refresh his skill in shooting. He'll stay after practice and shoot three to 500, make three to 500 shots after practice. Uh, to, to keep that shooting skill intact. So even though he is the best shooter that I can think of, uh, you know, he is not good enough to graduate from that skill. So actually the, the higher level you get, the more skills you have to refresh, if that makes sense. So I think that's really important to, uh, to understand. I'm going to put a video up here of a uh, couple of the drills that we do in, uh, and let me see if I can, you might have to help me with this. Uh, 
here's here's an example of of uh, can you see? Can everybody see this? Yeah, it's a video. It's right. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you. This is an example of footwork. Now let's go the other direction. Ready? Some footwork drills that we do not only with our junior national team, and I'll enlarge this picture so you can see it. Uh, but we kind of we start practice every day with this very simple footwork drills uh, with our with my ten year old team. I will probably use this. You maybe do this for ten or fifteen minutes in a day, and uh, with my junior national team, I may do it for two minutes just to refresh it uh, as well. So uh, let me play this a little bit and. Stop. What do you get? But I think you need to find out what's important to you and your team, and then coaches and their and what they're teaching uh, on on a level that you want. But anyway, I said there's three things you have to do in practice every day. Three, you've got to do them every day, and not only at that level, but I still real feel strongly at the high school level you have to do them. First one is footwork. You got to do footwork drills every day. You know, at some point, I know with our junior national team, it's really interesting because athletically, you know, the Jason Tatum, who we've had, Josh, Josh Jackson, uh, Jaron, Jaron Jackson, Wendell Carter here at Pace Academy. Those guys are so athletically good that they can dominate their opposition at, at that age. But at some point, skill will have to take over. Now, you know, Wendell's going to play for the Bulls. Uh, Troy Brown's playing for the Wizards. Those guys all got drafted in the, in the, in the top 15, but they're going to have to – their skill level will have to click, kick in and take over at some point. And so what we try and do with our national team level is help them understand that, you know, if you put this skill with your athletic ability, that's really what's going to make you a player. It's not just your athletic ability. It's not just your skills, but you put both of them together. That's where you want to be. So the three things I think you should really work on, I said, is footwork. Second thing is passing. Third thing is shooting. I think those are three things you have to really work on every day in practice. Obviously, we think the others are important too. But let's say your third grade team has uh, 45 minutes for practice, which sometimes happens a lot. Those are, th those are the only three things that we would have them do shooting, footwork, and passing. Now, you might integrate that with three-man, three three-on-three three three type things, uh, but those are three skills I think are really important in what you do. Well, uh, other thing we told them, and, and, you know, sometimes I think young coaches get so wrapped up into winning that they don't last in the profession. I'll say it again. I think young coaches get so wrapped up into winning that they don't last in the profession. They drop out because their only goal is to win. Well, you know, they have a bad year going, you know, four and 20. They're going to say, you know, I didn't accomplish anything, so I'm going to get out of coaching. So that, that's something I think as a young coach for me, when, when Coach Wooden emphasized time and again that that's not the measure of your success, I felt that made me a better coach. Uh, you're going to see what we do. We start practice with, with – uh, my nine-year-old grandson's team, we start practice with my high school team, and we start practice with our national team this very same way. So first thing is we're going to dribble out with the left hand, make a jump stop at about the blue line. We're going to reverse pivot, left foot back on a reverse pivot. Uh, show me what I just said. Awesome. Now make the pass. Don't walk to the end of the line. We're going to jog to the end of the line. Ready? Go. Got a few hops in there. That's all right. Okay, stop. Okay, so this is one of four pivots you need to, that you need to practice. And when, when you say, when I say practice, I think you should spend a little bit of time on each day with these four, with, four, with the four, uh, four pivots. Now, let's go back to your practice. And uh, I, I definitely think Throughout my coaching career of 42 years, I learned a lot about practice. 
I learned how to make practice, how to, how to find pace in your practice. You, as a coach, you, you di dictate the pace of your practice, not them. They will try to dictate your pace, won't they? I know they do. So if I would say, all right, give me, uh, give me three lines in the baseline. They're going to dictate the pace they do it, aren't they? See, just like that, right? So you're letting them dictate your pace of practice. Pace in practice is really important. Now, I changed my mind. So I want four lines out here, and you got five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. So what was the difference? What was the difference? The difference was it was it was my pace. It wasn't their pace. So I always, you know, a lot of times in practice, I'll count back, I'll count backwards. I'll say, all right, we're going to get in this drill. You got 10, 10, 9, 8, and, and they run to that drill. Now, I'm not sure what would happen if I'd ever get down to zero. I don't know. Probably they'd run or do some nasty stuff, but I've never gotten down to zero. They, they, they kind of know that that's not a thing to get to is down to zero. So now you're setting the pace of your practice. And I, I watched just, I was on Vegas and watched Jeff Van Gundy. Uh, put together the practice for the team that played Uruguay last night. And he was really uh, emphasized pace in practice because that's how you play. So the more you stop practice, the slower your pace is. So just be careful that as a coach, uh, there are two things you got to bring to practice every day as a coach, two things, enthusiasm and passion. If you don't bring those two things practice every day your practice will not be good i'll guarantee you and you know what practice bad practices are not their fault bad practices are our fault as a coach if you i never blame bad practices on the players i think it's something that we coaches can take care of so if you come with enthusiasm you come with passion you come we're ready to set the pace of your practice i think your practice will be good they'll follow they'll follow what your expectations are so just be careful with those kind of things in your practice. Okay, now we're going to do. Uh, now we're going to do a, a reverse pivot, right right foot reverse pivot. So you're going to dribble out right handed, swing your right foot back. Same drill. Go. Okay, very good. Awesome. Okay, a little travel, but we'll take care of that. Get that foot down. Okay, stop. Now we're going to do a, now you're going to dribble a left hand and you're going to take a left foot front pivot. That means we're going to bring the toe around front. You're going to make a front pivot. Okay, whoa, 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 just a minute. Just, this is how I would conduct it in practice if we're just starting. I, I explain it. And by the way, explain it one time. Don't, don't explain things more than once. Because what happens is your players will shut you out. They won't listen to you the first time. Because they know that, oh, he's just going to repeat it. So I don't really have to listen the first time. So get in the habit of just saying things once. And then you can demonstrate it, have somebody demonstrate it, and then you do the drill. The more often you explain it, the less they listen. That goes in your timeouts, too. You know, they're not used to listening in practice the first time. So you call them over in a timeout. Uh, three of them listen the first time. Two of them don't. You're screwed. Now all of a sudden you got two guys playing man, three guys playing zone. Uh, you're really screwed. So those kind of things, that's a direct result of your practice sessions. Okay. Show me what I just said. There we go. Okay, go. Now we go front pivot. So we did two reverse pivots. Now we're going to do two front pivots. Okay, stop. Now we're going right hand dribble, right foot front pivot. Go. Good job. Sit. Stay low. Keep that ball in tight. Keep that ball in tight. Good. Okay. Awesome. Good. Okay. Stop. So learn to coach while the drill is going on. Learn to coach while the drill is going on. 
if you have to stop a drill every time you want to make a correction that you're, you're first of all you lost your pace your practice secondly you really lost you know probably 12 of your players when you correct or 11 of your players when you correct one guy for what you want done and then learn learn to change your drill as it's going now what i'm going to do is i'm going to call out that i'm going to call out the hand dribble and the pivot you'll do as you're doing it so you demonstrate let's start out left hand dribble left foot reverse pivot so we start out this way oh, oh, oh left foot reverse, reverse pivot yeah okay now keep going keep going keep going i might say all right right hand keep going reverse pivot right hand dribble reverse pivot right foot Good. Good. Left hand dribble, front pivot. Okay, stop. So now what you're doing is you're you're making them listen. You're forcing them to do do the correct drill while they're on the move. So without stopping the drill and changing it, you're doing it, you're doing it while the drill's going on. And again, this is exactly how we do things with uh, you know, when I had the Jason Tatum's of the world, uh, Wendell Carter's, Colin Sexton's, we did, this is how we started practice. Now, obviously we're gonna do it less time because we're refreshing some of this stuff with that, the term refresh is great. We're refreshing it with, with those, that group as opposed to my nine-year-olds where we may spend, you know, 15 minutes with this. Okay, you got the drill? Go, left hand, left hand, left foot reverse, go. Oh, oh, refer left foot, left other left foot, reverse, left foot reverse. Think about it before you come out. There you go. Okay, that gives you uh, kind of a, a good uh, good example of how we do the footwork and, and what we emphasize on that. Um, I think now, unless it would now be a good time for to questions. I don't know what, what you have as far as questions go, or I can continue on a few other things. Um, uh, Coach, it's, uh, it's up to you. If you have uh, something else you want to go into, uh, or we could uh, start going to some questions. Uh, it's, it's, it's up to you, whatever you prefer. Um, uh, because we, we only have, uh, we don't have many questions yet. So maybe this is a chance for people watching us to send us their questions. Uh, we're, watching, we're watching the live uh, uh, stream on the Facebook page of the Federation and any questions will be carried to the coach. So coach, maybe we could go one question till we get the chance for other people right now, if that's okay. Yep. Uh, the question is from uh, Jimmy. Uh, he says, uh, do you share those principles and standards uh, that define USA national basketball team to high school coaches? And also, do you provide uh, do you provide them with practice schedules and drills? Absolutely. Uh, we have. Uh, if you're interested, I mean, I can send you these out uh, as well. Uh, the, the especially the <clears throat> you know the, the I'd be glad to send out the gold standards. Uh, if you would email me, um, and again, your uh, your coach association, I think, has my email address, but I can give it to you real quick here. It's just, it's just my name, first first initial, D. Showalter at usabasketball.com is my uh, email address. If you email, email me, I can send you out any of the information that we talked about today uh, as well. So um, that's a great question. I, I, I send that out a lot, but the uh, especially standards are something that I think a lot of coaches are interested in, uh, at least implementing for, for their team as well. All right. So we have another question from uh, Marios, uh, Marios Anaxagoru. Uh, he has actually a, a couple of parts on his question. Uh, the, the annual planning of the team, is it done according to the players each uh, team has available? That's the first uh, part. If you want, you could answer that one first. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we have coaching uh, my high school team is a little different because we have different players every year. So we're not going to be able to have one year. We might have a 
player who's very, very tall. And we have to, we have to uh, make sure that we put in place uh, our offense and defense that can utilize his length and his size. The next year we may have very, very short team. So we have to change what we're doing. That's part of coaching with our U16 and U17 team. We can pretty much stay. Uh, we can pretty much keep what we like to do. Uh, what we like to do at a, uh, 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 the same level every year, because we basically have the same type of players that are, that come back every year for us. So, uh, so we don't change much with our, with our junior national teams as a high school coach, I would change every year depending on uh, the strengths and weaknesses of my team. Right. Coach, if it's easy, if it's possible, you could uh, stop doing the share screen just for a second. Oh, so we can focus. Yeah, no, no, just so we could, you know, focus on uh, on yourself and not the, uh, the screen part. Uh, so the, let's continue with Mario's his other parts. Um, um, when we don't have that much time in a week, uh, we need to adapt to um, and do the practices. Uh, let me rephrase the question because I'm reading as well as I'm watching here. Um, uh, he asked, what's your opinion, depending on the obligations of the team, when we don't have much time during a week for practices, how do we adapt to this and uh, uh, depending on the obligations of the team? Yeah, uh, I assume we're talking uh, a little higher age level on this. Or He's talking, talking about particular Mario, he, he coaches uh, youth from like uh, very young to even uh, teenagers. So uh, yeah, the, awesome. I guess it's a big range of the team. Yep. Well, uh, if you if you uh, if you looked at what I had what I said in the video, I think three of those skills you have to work on every day: shooting, passing, and footwork. Now you can do some combination of those drills, but I think every day in practice, no matter if you have thirty minutes, if you have an hour or two hours, you have to put in at least those three skills. Um, and then I would do uh, I would play a lot of three on three. I mean, I, I I'm very uh, confident that three on three will help develop skills uh, in a in a in a more rapid way, but also it's a it's a, a method that uh, will teach kids how to play. They'll let that you let them they'll they'll be able to figure things out on their own with three on three. So I think I would I would certainly recommend uh, you know having three skills that you work on. Uh, in a combination of drills, that's part of being what you do as a coach, and then uh, do, playing some three-on-three. Three. And, and that three-on-three three action is very rarely uh, for the coach to make a lot of corrections. You let them play three-on-three three and then have them, like I said, figure it out, and then you can, then you can make some uh, points to them. But I think that's, that would be – in my estimation, that's what the best way to do it. If you have a little, not very much time. Okay. Uh, and then Mario, he also asked for the notes and video. So you gave your um, email uh, just to repeat. It's your first initial, the D D for Dom and the show Walter at USA Is that correct? Correct. Yep. And I will so get next, to, Yeah. Anybody who emails me, I'll, I, I'll get those out to you within 24, 48 hours. That's my goal. All right, so the next question is from Strados. He, first of all, he says it's a great honor to have you with us tonight. Uh, his question is, what is the feedback given in different ages and the frequency of it? What is the feedback given in different ages? And so, yeah. so I think the feedback, uh, I always say you need to give four positive feedbacks for every one negative. So if you're teaching... If there's a young player, uh, even through high school, even through 16 years old, but uh, if, if you really want to increase behavior, change behavior that you want to see, you will, you will, every time you see the behavior you want as a coach, the positive behavior, you will make a comment about how, how good that is. Uh, sometimes we ignore 
behavior we don't uh, obviously want to see, but we really praise behavior we want to see. So if I'm coaching a seven, eight, nine year old, if they, <clears throat> to make them love the game, they want to feel like they're having some success and they want to feel good about playing the game of basketball. We give four positive to every one negative. Uh, and then also we say teach in a sandwich method, which means that you will give them something positive and then maybe make a correction or how they can do things better and then end up with a positive. That's kind of the sandwich method that we recommend for, for teaching the game. So uh, I hope that helps answer your question, but I think you really need as a coach, you need to be uh, willing to point out positive behaviors on the court when you see them. Uh, for instance, like somebody gets a great rebound, call them out by their names. Hey, Billy, that is a great rebound. So everybody on the team knows what you think is a great rebound. And I think that develops roles for the players. Then Billy will start thinking, you know what? I'm a pretty good rebounder. Uh, I think maybe that's the way I can get more playing time or I can do a good job uh, is, is being a rebounder. So um, that's part of a, kind of the psychology of coaching that is really necessary uh, to, to put in. I hope that answers your question. Uh, um, well, it, it was very interesting. And I, I guess you could use the four uh, positives and one negative in various aspects and not only in basketball, obviously. Throughout right, the exactly. Yep. I mean, uh, yeah. So our next question is from Saigis. Uh, he wants to ask coach if, uh, if, if you are timing all your drills and practices so you can maintain that kind of type of discipline. Uh, that's the first part of the question. Uh, so if you're timing all your drills and practices so you could maintain that kind of type of discipline. Absolutely. I mean, our, uh, and I can send out practice schedules as well, but our practice schedules are uh, very organized with uh, time for each drill. And so uh, as a younger coach, I think I made some mistakes uh, in practice as a younger coach when, when a drill would not go correctly. And you're thinking as a coach, You know, we're going we're gonna to do this drill until we get it right. And I found out pretty quickly that that drill never gets better. It only gets more frustrating as a co to a coach. <clears throat> it only gets more frustrating to the players. So let's say we do a certain drill for 10 minutes. At the end of 10 minutes, we're done with that drill. No matter how good or how poor it's going, we move on to the next one. And I think as a coach, that helps your pace of your practice, as I talked about in the video a lot, helps the pace of your practice, uh, but it also helps, we'll come back to maybe at the next day and hopefully we get better at it, but uh, we, we move on from one thing to the other. So as a coach, your organization and your practice is such that you, you, you get these things accomplished, uh, And, and when that time is up for that individual skill or drill that you're doing, move on. And I think you pretty much answered the second part of the question, was what, which was how, are, how do you deal with practices that don't get the desired intensity and pace? Yeah, I mean, that's a little different question because you, you know, uh, the pace, as I said in the, in the video, pace is really what, what you as a coach Uh, try to organize in your practice. And if you don't get that, uh, you know, I think you have to do, you have to, you know, obviously do some other things. Now, whether it might be uh, some, some extra running, which I hate to do, but also sometimes you have to let them know that what's, uh, what's unacceptable. And if this is unacceptable, then there's going to be another, uh, another thing that we, uh, that we have to emphasize in order to make that acceptable. So there's some accountability there. Um, whether that accountability is no matter what, it might be one push-up, uh, but it gets them back on track thinking that, uh, you know, I, I, I need to do a better job. And then as a coach, uh, keep, keep, uh, very, keep in mind that your uh, the positive behavior that you want to get should be recognized. 
And that's really important. So if Billy, so a lot of times I might say uh, in a practice, uh, if Billy's there at the front of the line, he's ready to go. I'll say, hey, great job, Billy. You're ready to go. That shows great leadership on your part. So, so now the other players who are not ready, they see what I do to Billy uh, and praise him for his responsible actions. It makes everybody else kind of kind of come up in line. So, um, yeah, that's a great question. And, and sometimes you just have to kind of, as a coach, play it by ear. Um, the other thing is I will always say you can be demanding without being demeaning. In other words, you don't want to demean your players into doing something, but you can certainly be demanding. Hey, here's, here's my expectations. Now you're not living up to my expectations. So therefore we got to keep you accountable. And here's what we're doing to keep you accountable. So being demanding is, is really what coaches, what players want from a coach because they all want to get better, but they don't want to be demeaning. They want to, they don't want to be, you know, Hey, that, that was a stupid thing to do. I mean, that's demeaning uh, along with being demanding. So uh, I think that's a really, what I've learned is really a important thing there. Uh, another question from Costas. Uh, do you recognize different type of characters in youth kids from state to state? And uh, do you try to find it? Uh, I guess this means the different type of characters. And how do you coach coach these different types? Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not sure the definition of characters other than different, different players, different skill levels, those kind of things. Different areas of our country do, I mean, like I would say right now, and I'm sure it's probably the same way for other countries, but right now, um, you know, there's some really good areas for high school basketball that we know we're going to go see and see some kids that fit what we want for our national team. Uh, Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. is a, is really a, an area. Maryland, Washington, D.C. area is very, very good high school basketball. Um, Houston, Texas is one of those places uh, as well. Um, Atlanta, Georgia. So we just know that those areas are going to pr produce some really good basketball players that we can go watch teams there play and, and come away with, with knowing that we had some really good players. And then there's always some, you know, there's always players outside of, of, the, of you know, the, that you don't expect to, to or, or to find players, but, uh, again, you can see we, we find these because they all, they all play on in summer basketball clubs around the country. So very few players uh, go without being noticed. And uh, I think that's the kind of the, the thing that we have to strive for. I, I'm not sure that really answers his question about characters, but I think that's probably what he meant. Uh, okay, so our, our next question is from Fivos. Uh, what, what is the coach's advice, your coach, on how to get the young kids to want to keep playing basketball instead of choosing some other sport, since uh, many kids at a young age are actually practicing different sports at the same time? Yep. And, and we, we, encourage, we encourage kids to play every sport they want to. Uh, we encourage kids to play soccer, basketball. We call it soccer. Uh, basketball might be lacrosse. It might be... American football. We, we encourage that at a, at a young age, <clears throat> uh, for sure. And then, you know, we want the, we want the players to love the game of basketball. So we use like uh, shorter baskets, less less height on baskets, eight foot baskets for younger kids, seven, eight, nine year olds. Smaller basketball. Those are all ways that you know that they can have success. If you don't have success. Uh, with a game, you're probably not going to stay with it. So if you're going to have some success, then you're going to say, hey, this is fun. I can, I can make this basket. It's an eight foot bat. I can score uh, the smaller basketball. I can handle a basketball better uh, as well. So uh, these recommendations that we have, and I know FIBA and the mini basket has uh, pretty much the same recommendations. You know, we, we recommend don't no zone until age about 14. There shouldn't be you should not play a two, three zone with a group of eight year olds. That's no fun for the offensive team or the defensive team. 
uh, as well. So those recommendations are in place for the player to have fun. And once they have success, they're going to stay with it. And we find out not only do our recommendations, but also then how the coach coaches those players is really important. Uh, the positive impact they have, the coaches have, will make those players love the game. And uh, we keep going back to, you know, young players stay with the game because they love the game. If they're if they, if they're if they go to a practice and and there's a yeller and a screamer as a coach, and all he does is pick out the negative things that I do as a player, I'm not going to love the game. I'm not going to want to go back to practice. So I want to go somewhere where the environment is a very positive environment where I feel safe. I can, I can improve my skills, have a great time with the people, the other boys and girls that are with me. And then I'm going to stay in the game, whether it be as a player, as a coach, as a referee, as a, a person who works a table, uh, as announcers, you know, we all need those kind of people to stay with the game because that's, that's what helps makes our game strong. All right, so the ne next question from uh, Luis. Uh, Hi, coach, he says. Uh, should we yeah. emphasize on the technique of, of the pass or the timing of the pass? Uh, great question, Luis. Uh, the actually passing, I, I say, is, is, is I give up technique for decision-making, and decision-making deals with timing. So, so as a player gets better, It's older, I think more emphasis needs to be placed on the timing of the pass, the, the who to pass the ball to, decision-making of that pass, I think is probably more important than the actual technique. Now, if I'm teaching a group of seven-year-olds, I'm going I'm to teach technique to them, two-handed chest pass, two-handed bounce pass, so they have that technique. But uh, as I progress, and then in your three-on-three -three, uh, short-sighted games, when you play three-on-three, as they get a little older, they're going to have to figure out how to make that pass. That's, that's where the decision-making comes in. So um, I really feel passing is one of those where, you know, you, you maybe your technique is important, but timing and decision-making as the player gets more developed is more important. From uh, Marios, uh, another question. Uh, when, the, when the coach of the national team chooses the players, Uh, should there or is there communication with the coaches uh, of the players? He's talking about the club level, and uh, and is there exchange of what the, the needs are of the players and how they could help you, the national team? Uh, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing in that question is, do we converse with the, the club coaches that they're playing with or the high school coaches? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, de I mean, definitely. <clears throat> and, and one of the things you have to understand, uh, club basketball is probably, in, in some ways, it's secondary to their high school season. So the high school coach has a lot of influence on the, on the players. Once the high school season is over, then the club season takes over. So it's kind of like two different seasons in the United States. Whereas international-wise, you know, they play for club all the way through maybe from ages 10 or 11 all the way up through professional, uh, which is certainly not the case with the way it is here in the United States. But we, we certainly, and players have, you know, they have their own personal trainers or they may have uh, uh, dad, father, uncle, cousin, who is around in their circle, we call it. And so you kind of have to negotiate who is really uh, trustworthy from that player standpoint. I think it's better now than it used to be. Uh, it used to be kind of really mucky muck where you really have to kind of go through two or three people. You don't trust any of them uh, to find out, uh, you know, how to contact the player or just, just to get some answers from the player. Now it's more, you go right to the player uh, or the high school coach with many, many times. Okay. Uh, so I think we covered all the questions that were available. I don't know, Coach, if you want to add something else uh, in your presentation. You got something else planned? Uh, not really. I mean, I I have I probably have three hours of stuff that I could go go through. So, uh, but I just hope that uh, this was uh, 
really good for the coaches that, uh, that tuned in and I appreciate, uh, you tuning in. I, I heard, a, I heard a, uh, comment one time with, there's two times that there's two types of coaches. Uh, one, one, one group of coaches that are very humble and one group of coaches that will be very humbled. And that's kind of the game of basketball is that, you know, we're, we're humbled because of the game. And if we aren't at some point, we're going to be humbled because of the game. And, uh, uh I always, I always, uh, really take that to heart. So I uh, appreciate uh, the fact that you're on all you coaches are listening and, and, uh, getting something from this and, and, uh, uh, again, email, feel free to email me with anything, uh, any information that you want. Um, like I said, I, I give, I give a lot of international clinics. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, I was supposed to be over in Dubai and Spain and, uh, and Italy this year, but obviously, uh, the coronavirus took that out. So, uh, next summer I'll be in a lot of different places around the world, uh, giving some clinics and, and I hope to see many of you there. And if, I, if you are at a clinic uh, that I'm at, uh, make sure that you come and introduce yourself and let me know that you were on that you were on this uh, on this Zoom clinic. Uh, and again, I appreciate the Cypress Basketball Association uh, putting this on because I know it takes a lot of effort uh, to put that on, and and uh, as well, especially Bobby Quayle. I don't know many people know Bobby Quayle, but he's part of the Cypress Basketball Association, so. I appreciate him as well. All right. Thank you very much, Coach. It was a pleasure listening to you, and uh, we wish you all the best in your career and uh, soon to be out of your home in Ohio and, and in Iowa and back to uh, uh, back to the court where we all belong. Yes, for sure. For sure. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you very much.